some major uh, drone research going on, mm -hmm. and you know, in particular at Creech and Hancock and uh, and Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Um, at Hancock, we've had a, a series of actions. We've had at least we've had probably seven or eight actions now in which people have been arrested. Um, we we go to a small town court in DeWitt, New York, where um, there are two judges who are both part-timers, Judge Gideon and Judge Jokel. Um, they're getting very tired of us, and we're really we're tying up. This is a small town court that's used to dealing with shoplifting and, and drunk driving. And uh, at, at first, Judge Gideon was very interested and let us use, in the Hancock 38 trial, uh, let us bring in uh, an international law argument and we were allowed to bring in Ramsey Clark for an evening to testify and it was a, it was a wonderful, he still found us guilty, but it was a wonderful trial. Um, it, the next year, we it, again on Earth Day has been the traditional day for trying to do major resistance there. Um, we were walking to the base and were arrested as we were walking to the base for parading without a permit. Um, it caught everybody by surprise once we passed the town boundary of, of DeWitt and for a while the, the police herded everybody into, into a parking lot and told the people who weren't at all planning to get arrested, including one of my students, that if you try to leave, we're going to arrest you. We're going to charge you with you know, resisting arrest as well as parading without a permit. And finally, they negotiated letting some people go and then arrested a bunch of us. And, uh, but then that one was so bogus that the, the Onondaga County District Attorney turned it back to the uh, attorney for the town of DeWitt to prosecute us, and they decided to drop, just drop the charges, because that one was pretty bogus. And then uh, there were several actions after that. What they started to do then, and, and I think this is worth talking about a little bit, is to issue us orders of protection um, the base commander. to protect the base commander. Yes. and. If I can find it, I'll uh, somewhere here. I've got a copy of it. Uh, bas basically, they uh, yeah. pass, it, pass them around, see, just so you can see. Um, they they've issued orders of protection for um, Colonel Greg Zemel um, that we need to stay away from his home, his school, his business, which of course is. Hancock Air National Guard Base, um, and, and his place of employment, and it's checked off that I personally need to uh, refrain from communication or any other contact by mail, telephone, email, voicemail, or other electronic or any other means with Greg A. Zemel. Um, and of course, I have to stay away from his home. I don't even know where he lives. I don't even know what he looks like, so I can't stay away from him. And secondly, and, and as, as a nonviolent activist, I mean, you, you guys might appreciate this, um, I need to refrain from assault, stalking, harassment, aggravated harassment, menacing, reckless endangerment, strangulation, oh. criminal obstruction of breathing or circulation, <laughs> disorderly conduct, criminal mischief, sexual abuse, sexual misconduct, forcible touching, intimidation, threats or any criminal offense or interference with the victim or victims of or designated witnesses to the alleged offense and such members of the family or household of such victims or witnesses as shall be specifically named Greg A. Zemel. So, if I guess Greg doesn't have to worry about me sexually assaulting him. Um, <laughs> Either they left off making faces at him from the top of the mountain. Don't tell. Don't tell them. <laughs> don't don't inform them. Um, they they didn't they didn't check off that I have to refrain from intentionally injuring or killing without justification the following companion animals or pets. Uh, uh, so I guess I am allowed to go after his dog if he has one. But uh, Only if the dog wanders away from home. Right, right. So, I, I mean, it, I, I find, we found these, first of all, insulting to women because I think orders of protection 
um, have been an important tool for right. pre preventing domestic abuse. And because of that, they have to, in order to be effective, they have to. Be, it has to be pretty loose. You don't have to be convicted of a crime to get one, et cetera, et cetera. And now there's there is this move in the last two years to take this tool and use it to stifle dissent. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've had contact with people in the fracking movement who have been issued orders of protection for corporations okay. so that they can't go near the corporate person, they can't go near the property. Um, and, and, and this, I think, is becoming you know, kind of a separate issue in itself that has to do with free speech because if this works, you know, um, they're gonna be able you know, to, to keep, keep us away from protesting anything. Now, um, it, it, the development has been interesting. Dan, Dan Finley from Ithaca um, got a lawyer. He was arrested with me when we got these orders of protection. And uh, the lawyer appealed his order of protection and got it overturned for him. Um, but the court has reissued our orders of protection. And just a couple weeks ago, they convicted Marianne Grady Flores of Ithaca of violating her order of protection, um, which carries up to, um, in this case, they're only charging her worth a year. If, if you note, we can be charged with up to seven years for violating this. Um, and so she's gonna be sentenced on July 11th. She was convicted in a jury trial. The jury wasn't allowed to be told that a pre another defendant had his order of protection uh, overturned. Um, so, so they're going ahead with this. Judge Gideon just uh, renewed my order of protection for another year, and I haven't had this problem yet. But are you saying that Marianne can be in prison for a year, a one-year prison term? Uh, it'll be a jail term, but yeah, it, they're not really going to do that, right? I mean, well, we'll find out July um, July tenth. There'll be an appeal, won't there? That I. I think she is planning an appeal because this was a case, in Mary Ann's case, she had not intended to violate the order of protection. She was at, she was at a, another demonstration where other people were blocking the, blocking the gate, and she crossed over to take, you should watch this now, to take pictures, and then left, and then as she was walking away, they came and arrested her for violating the order of protection, even though she wasn't doing any you know, civil disobedience, wasn't intending to do any civil disobedience. So I think the police have pictures of all the people who have been issued orders of protection, so they can pick them up or pick them off if they... If they choose to. Yeah, and the last, the last the time days. when you were there, they threatened to do that, and then they didn't. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so I mean, they're, they're, they're playing games obviously, but... Um, pick them up, pick them up, I understand, pick them off? Really? Well, you know, in other words, they're serious about, you know, they're serious about enforcing the order of protection in the sense of keeping the people that have been issued one away from the base. So yeah. if you end up, even in a peaceful demonstration, you end up at the base, you know, you're very likely to be arrested. Right. Well, the new orders of protection that we just got um, now have a stipulation that if it's a legal demonstration and we stay within the legally designated right. free speech zone, that we're allowed to be there. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, because that because that was the issue that the that Dan's order of protection yeah. got overturned on, and so Judge Gideon ah. apparently believes that adding this stipulation will make these. Mm -hmm. These stick, but the the interesting thing is that Marianne's order of protection didn't have that. It was was the same kind of order of protection as was overturned, and yet now she's facing conviction on on this. And I, I don't. Well, we don't know what they're going to do, but I suspect I suspect that they will give her some jail time. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we have um, good friends in Syracuse who go to the same church as Judge Gideon. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And. And it's a, they're Catholic, um, but they're, um, they're Catholics who are activists. And, um, and evidently, he, according to, to our friends, this, was a, this presented a real moral dilemma for him. And so he did a lot of his own studying and homework. And 
He did, yes. Whatever, and really wrestled with it. Yes, he did. He did, and especially. But since the first trial, it seems like his position, he's now, he seems to have the position that I've wrestled with it, I've made my decision, and yeah. that's. And so he has to reinforce what he's. That, that seems, that would be my interpretation. Yeah, I'm uh, curious if any. Inroads who made like the domestic violence community or advocacy um, organizations um, about the use of these borders of protection in a really sort of vile manner by the state. And we uh, in Syracuse, folks have tried to talk to the uh, groups there, and I think I think are getting some interest. What the judges will say is that that this is a different type of order of protection than what's issued in this is in domestic violence cases, yeah. but I haven't done the legal research to see exactly what, whether this is another difference without a distinction. Because the, the, the orders of protection that, that are to protect women or um, they're, they're given out when someone has already proven that they are, um, that they are a risk to this person. Mm -hmm that they've gone after them. Right, and but they don't have to be convicted of it. No, but, but, the, but they've, they, they've at least um, demonstrated ill will towards the person. Mm -hmm. and, and you've not done anything to this base commander. I mean, there, there's nothing, <laughs> there, there's nothing so one on one or personal <laughs> about that at all, and yet they seem to be making it that way. Well, yeah, what, what, what the officers who have testified in trials for other people have said is that they, uh, that no, there's no personal threat, but that we pose a danger to people on the base and to traffic, and therefore they, act, and for that reason they've requested the order of protection. But, but the order still <laughs> reads like this, and, you know, and, and practically speaking, um, you know, I'm a, I did go into Canada once and got back in and, and got back in safely, but other friends who have traveled who have gotten these and got traveled internationally or, or yeah. even just flown have been pulled out because of this order of protection. All all they get is that you know, all all they have on record is this, which says nothing about the context of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, about the context. It mm. you know, it's just I'm not allowed to assault, stalk, sexually abuse, <laughs> menace this person. So I mean, you know what? So I, you know, so now for for at least two years of my life, I'm going to have the regardless of what else happens, I'm I'm going to have this attack, you know, attached to my records anytime I travel. Um, so even if I even if I'm found not guilty, I'll have had this. Mm -hmm in effect for two years. So, you know, they pretend that it's nothing. Um, and, and they, you know, they do have, they would have the option of doing what so many military bases have done, which is to, to give you, um, to give you a letter stating that, you know, you, you're not allowed back in a, you know, a ban and bar letter, but the base would have to do that and the base wants the local government to handle it. They don't want to. Mm. They don't want to do it, so they're taking the order of protection route. Mm. And the, at least one of the judges had never even heard of the ban and bar letters. I take it. I take it that it's impossible, really, to think of people like you suing them as being unconstitutional. I, I mean, what, mm. well, I I don't know what. Well, I mean, I I don't like getting involved in the in the legal system except as a defendant. Um, even that I don't particularly like, but uh, I, I mean, we, you know, we, we will have to keep talking about this and maybe, maybe decide to also, you know, get lawyers and try to appeal. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, well, unless we can get, uh, we've, we've had some pretty good lawyers who have done pro bono work and, uh, and we've had a lot of support from Mary Ellen O'Connell, who's a, uh, an international law expert, uh, 
at uh, Notre Dame Law School, who has mm -hmm. become kind of the, you know, she spoke in, in Rochester and has spoken in Syracuse a couple times, and, mm -hmm. and her, uh, her legal analysis has really evolved, I think, over, uh, she's, uh, she's just very good, so she's not like a criminal lawyer, but, um, but we, we've been able to use, to use her for issues of international law, I think. Uh, are they continuing to give these out for like, because this, this was based on an action, there's been action since then. Yes. Um, so are they continuing to give them out? So yes, but oh. they, they, they yes they now have put in this additional clause about uh, so for new people and when they update them and so when they update them yeah 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 it seems really sinister it seems to be it's really important to challenge that so yeah yeah well and and for a while we thought that when Dan won his case that it would yeah. they'd all get that it, over. that it all go, get over but they're they're playing hardball on it so. Yeah, yeah. Harry, Harry, you mentioned the uh, international pressure uh, with the drones. Where, where is that coming from? What's it look like? Well, there's been, um, well, well, certainly in Pakistan there have been huge demonstrations. Um, in England there have been demonstrations and civil resistance. Um, the, the British have also flown um, Reapers in in Afghanistan, and they so they've been responsible for killing some people in Afghanistan. And it, it seems like the British have better data on on, on British use of drones in Afghanistan than, than we've got than I've been able to find so far on U.S. use mm -hmm. um, of them. So in Britain, there have been demonstrations in in Australia and. And I, I haven't kept track of all of them, but in, in a, you know, in a number of different countries at this point. So is, is it is it, it come before the UN at all? Um, no, I don't think so. And uh, I mean, with the U.S. having veto power and the Security Council and Britain having veto mm -hmm. power, there's not not much hope there. Um, yeah. I'd like to see it taken to the International Criminal Court, but of course the U.S. doesn't recognize that. <laughs> um, oh, so, gosh. all right, there is an increasing number of, of um, well, drones are being used more and more for families, and fathers like to use them. There's, there was an, uh, an online piece about a father who felt that was a great way for, for father and sons to bond. <laughs> And so the, the use of, of drones as games for kids is mm -hmm. increasing, and the use of drones for photographs, all kinds of, all kinds of use. Yes. That I wonder if it's going to make people impervious to the really lethal, because they'll be so taken up with how great they are. Well, yeah, and, and, and they, they're finding uses that, you know, most people couldn't disagree with, you know, searching for people who were lost in the wilderness, mm -hmm. um, sir, you know, um, protecting whales, things like, you know, um, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's, it's like all surveillance technology is, is insidious because it offers benefits, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, using, using our credit card, our way, you know, that's a, a way of, in which we voluntarily contribute to surveillance of us, but we do it because, or most of us do it because there are benefits to, you know, to doing that, and and, and you know, so that's that's you know that's the way that all all of this surveillance technology kind of gets gets sold is that there are good points and we don't. There's, and it's always an incremental process, a little step here. You never, you never have one big step where you make the decision. It just, you know, it, it just creeps. And in the space of a decade, you're finding yourself in a different world than what you may have imagined. Yeah, just a couple of thoughts. Um, I was going to say that that very much sounds like the grand narrative you were describing earlier, you know, this sort of uh, unbelievable technology where we can see anything, do anything, go anywhere, you know. And I'm wondering if, um, much like surveillance systems in our city or elsewhere, they're 
touted as solutions to problems when in fact they're just a further apparatus to develop um, surveillance of our whole community under the rubric of the state, under the rubric of an authority that is fairly unaccountable, um, more, more accountable locally certainly than federally. Right. But well, and, and probably then, also under, under, under the control of corporations, which right. are and even less. Right, and private tyrannies that want to make money off of it. And then it also, you, you said earlier about um, how there were, like, um, warriors within, you know, identified warriors within the United States Air Force who were questioning the use of drones because it seems to take the, the noble ease <laughs> out of, you know, being a soldier, right? Because you're just sitting behind the screen pushing a button. That's, what's, where's the warrior-ness in that? And my mind sort of left that head. I mean, Mary said earlier, like, it sounds like black people hanging out in the neighborhood or black kids hanging out in the neighborhood. And, I mean, the profiling isn't much different, it sounds like, over there as opposed to here. And if police stations are able to get these, you know, then suddenly you've got drones flying around everywhere watching everything, potentially. But then I wonder if there would be like a labor backlash because suddenly police aren't policing their sitting behind desks and looking at drone technology. I'm wondering if that sort of grossly is leading to some sort of um, fraying of the culture of militarism that we know. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. And then, and, and if that advancing that into like policing and domestic surveillance and assassinations, if that same frame might occur, I don't know. I mean, you just mentioned it briefly. Um, but my last point is, as a flying squirrel, like how can we use this space and the people that come in and out of here as um, a way to build, help build this movement or offer logistics or support, or what, what, what is the role of the flying squirrel in all this, I guess? Okay. Well, it's you know, whatever, whatever you'd like it to be. I, I, I mean, mean, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, we, uh, you know, one for me, one of the most exciting things it has been kind of the creation of over the last few years of the Upstate Anti Drone Network. Mm -hmm. um, that because we have we have peace people from Syracuse and Rochester and Buffalo and. Ithaca and Albany and, and Utica, um, for the last few years we've been meeting every couple months, we're just doing um, kind of gra in, on a grassroots level and, and focused primarily on one issue, but making connections among, you know, kind of the major upstate, and, and Binghamton, and major upstate communities, and it's just, for me it's been really exciting to, you know, just come to know some some of the people from the different cities, so that if any issue comes up, you know you have you have contacts that you've been working with now for for years. And and so I, I mean I I think you know having folks from the Flying Squirrel involved in in that would be good both for the anti drone network and and for the squirrel um, because you can kind of share what you're doing with other you know with people who might be interested in this. In, in this kind of thing in, in other cities. And it, so it, that's, that's a great thing. Um, you know, real concretely, if you, if you wanted to, I've got a copy of, you know, the video Unmanned, which is a, you know, which is a, uh, a, a good documentary, about an hour long, um, on, with inter the interview with uh, that, the drone pilot that I talked about, mm -hmm. and also interviews with um, victims of, of drones that, that might that might be a nice uh, discussion yeah, starter. Yeah, we've talked about that. Yeah, that that would be good. And uh, yeah, and then with boy, and the first question, I'm not so uh, not just so the, sure. the fraying of the military culture because yeah. of the anti-warrior kind of stance of sitting behind the screen and pushing a button. Like, how have you have you what else do you know about that? Like, what if, have you read about that? Is that well, just you know, just some of the critique. Just knowing that there is a critique within the military, and, and in particular, I think it's coming from um, pilots in, in the old sense of somebody who actually sat in a plane, because because that was you know that was seen you know very much as you know one of the glory jobs of the military, and now they're seeing their jobs being phased out. And first, 
you know, at, at first, you know, you had to be a, a real, quote, real pilot to become a drone pilot, but now, you know, they've, they've realized you don't have to go through that step. You can, you know, if you're good, good at computer games, you know, you can just go right into, uh, into piloting drones. You don't have to actually fly in a plane. And, and so they're, they're seeing their, their positions undermined. Their status. Yeah. Are, the, yeah. are there drone courses now in the military academies? Um, I believe that there are, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there are any in the. I had, I had to try to look at the Air Force Academy and see what we could find out. I haven't looked at that. That's a that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think the. But they don't learn to fly in the military academy either, do they? They go to flight school afterwards. I think. I think I I don't know enough about that. Kind of we'll have to. Have to take a field trip out to Colorado and <laughs> check it out. Uh, and I think Mary's been wanting to. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I wanted to go back to the um, using the orders of protection as a way to dampen things. And there's so many people in the room who, you know, were active during the call and tell period and old, you know, older periods. And a, it seems like there's a number of ways that instead of just arresting or assassinating people, dissenters that people are held up. Um, so this is one. And then there's like the FBI special um, grand jury subpoena process. Mm -hmm. They has a number of leading activists and dissenters hung up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then there's, um, I don't know if people are familiar with Reverend Pinckney in um, Bar Harbor, Michigan. He's fighting local privatization and he's on house arrest. Um, basically on some trumped up accusations regarding um, like his petitioning process in the local politics, but they've, they're basically silencing him with house arrest. So it's, so it's not like throwing someone in for a defined jail term or even a long prison term or um, you know other mechanisms. So I, I guess I'm just wondering, were there other I mean, I, and I know the history of um, what's the word? You know, like when you go in and you, pre you know, like, um, oh my God, I'm sorry, I'm tired. I didn't get rest until the return from New York. <laughs> um, you know, provocateurs, provocateurs, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, like sowing dissent and breaking up groups and organizations and, you know, that kind of thing. So I know about those strategies, but I'm just wondering, do you see, like, is there a difference in terms of, like, are these new tools that are being applied to kind of paralyze but not completely remove people from their jobs and things like is it a um, softer but just as a, or almost as effective way of squashing the dissent well I, I think they're experiment you know some somebody came up with this bright idea and they decided that it was worth experimenting with and uh, you know so I think they're trying to see if it will be an effective method of, but softer method of doing it than um, than giving us long prison terms. And and I, you know, and, and right now probably is the uh, is is a crucial time for that because almost everybody who's been you know in, involved with the campaign to this point now has an order of protection, at least one, sometimes two. Um, and several, several, you know, we're waiting, several people have violated their, you know, their orders of protection. We're, we're waiting to see what happens with Mary Ann. Um, and then there's uh, at least three, three other people who will uh, be going to trial on violating the order of protection within the next, right. within the next year. Um, so I, I, I think it's, and, and, and it's evolving, and we'll see if the higher courts uphold it. You know, at this point, I've got to say it's kind of it's kind of changed the game, in a sense, because I've I've tried to be very much in the Gandhian perspective in terms of being respectful and dealing with, you know, with judges, and and I've you know, I've liked Judge Gideon, but I, I still just feel a real sense, you know. A real sense of, of betrayal of even the commitment to justice that that mm -hmm. they you know that people would do this and mm -hmm. you know it, it's hard to express that in a 
nonviolent way and get your message across totally. Um, mm. You know, because I, I usually address the system rather than the person as being mm. at fault, but it, you know, and, and it still is the system, but it's, it's, it's hard to make that distinction sometimes. Would, would it be somewhere in the line, would it be a challenge to misuse of the order of protection in this situation? Well, we hope, we hope that there, there will. We're, um, we do have a small group that's uh, trying to research what's been happening with orders of protection across the country and historically and how, how this is developing. We, we, we fondly call them the oops for orders of protection. Yeah. And one of the ways that we have countered, oops, oops order, order of protection, uh, OOP. Yeah. And we, we've been, we have countered it with the poop, which is the people's order of protection. Um, <laughs> bringing it, a people's order of protection for the people of Afghanistan yeah. to be protect, to be protected yeah. from being killed by people at the base, which seems like a much more legitimate use of order of protection, but we haven't gotten much support from the criminal justice system for that one. But but I, I do like the idea of the poop. Yeah. Are they using them yeah. in other places you probably said? Hmm? Are they using this at other places, other bases where there's activism? Or other like are you aware of other uses? We we've been finding it in, in frack yeah, in fracking. Um we're trying that's something I'm gonna try to investigate over the summer. I haven't done that uh, enough. We'll have to do you want people to like put out feelers like around the country? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I think I think I think that would be great. We're what, what, just one other thing. Interesting tactic that if you if you get it if you're on the internet, Google or, or go to YouTube and and put in uh, Whiteman Air Force Base and protest because there's this uh, at, at one of the previous protests. Uh, three people went in to give, uh, what, what we usually do is go in and give an indictment of the base commander mm -hmm. for violating international law. Um, and then these troops or, or police came out in, in the riot gear, you know, with the helmets and the shields and the batons, and they were lined up in military formation. Yeah. And um, they started advancing, kind of chanting, going, boom, bam beating on it was like beating on the shield with their baton and in unison almost and they say move back move yes. back okay. no they're, no they're just going yeah. they're, just they're just chanting and banging and moving forward slowly yeah. and like Kathy Kelly you could hear Kathy Kelly's voice talking to them and uh, you know trying to calm them down and, I mean they were doing it was it just what were they really, chanting I think it was just I think it was just one, two, three, four, and, and a count of eight. I think they would stop for a while, and then they'd start up again and, and just keep moving. But it's it's uh, it was almost you know like well it, yeah it did look a little bit like goose stepping or or a very controlled war dance, um, just a ritual thing that was just just it's just very yeah. So they are really I mean you know. The government is, is really trying, I think, some different tactics. They don't like having people protesting the drones, and I think that that in itself gives you a clue that we're on to something real. If, if you know, if, if the government is coming up with all all of these new methods to try to deal with it, that, then it must be important to their project for control. Well, I want to thank Harry and Mary for coming oh. out tonight. That was great. Thank you for coming up with me.